Okay, very good morning to everyone. Hope you're doing well. It's Friday 31st of July. Uh, got the charts up to kick things off then following last night's mega tech cap earnings that came out. I'm sure you're semi-aware of how they performed so far, but I'm going to run through those in a bit more detail. Um, but going to start off really just looking at the charts overall because we've got dollar index has stabilized since it's pushed down in the overnight Asia Pacific session, but it is down about four tenths of 1%. That has created some fairly meaningful uh, extensions of some of the moves that we've been seeing in the currency pairs in euro dollar and cable so actually let's just start there with the currency markets because with this uh, continuation of dollar movement um, there was a momentary point yesterday where a uh, little bit of a renewed focus perhaps on the covid global situation somewhat triggered by this initial signs of potentially a second wave forming in mainland Europe made markets a little bit nervous but since then things have returned to trend almost and now the Fed meeting almost seems like a distant memory uh, some of that post movement we saw several hours after has been reversed the dollar back on the uh, back foot again and so in the euro dollar pair I'm looking at here it just continues to move back higher again and a notable point that you'll see here in the futures at least we breached 119 now to the upside and if I look on a weekly continuation chart this is the one that we've been watching quite closely of course over uh, a number of weeks and we've hit our objective now which was around that 118.93 so really key area we were we were talking about the psychological error of 118 there was this momentary hesitation about two days ago when we hit that initial move now we've gone up again another point added and to that 119 118.93 here looking on a weekly chart in the euro um, and we've we've come up to that point so you know really impressive run that's continued here for the euro uh, and predominantly led by the last 24 hours by an extension of dollar weakness more than euro strength uh, and that is then reflected in the the dollar pairs because cable likewise has just continued its its run and I guess putting this on a on a daily continuation chart as well there's not a great deal now of resistance for cable uh, but there is some meaningful resistance coming up uh, which is around the highs that we were printing just really before the whole pandemic really took hold so this would have been in early March uh, that also encapsulated some of the price activity we had right at the beginning of the year um, this is the the kind of January highs if we X out the actual price movement that we saw right at the, the first day of this year we are coming up to year-to-date highs in the British pound against the dollar so yeah we're about 60 70 pips or so away but 132 now just seems a, a logical target uh, for us to push up now uh, any of these speculators just to, to squeeze it up into there and that will be a stern level of resistance I'm sure and just interestingly then you've got that 132 and you've got that 119 kind of air in euro on that weekly chart which goes all the way back to that previous level we were just looking at so some some big levels here um, that might well see a little bit of profit taking uh, or at least provide a bit of an upside cap to price activity should we continue on this trend at the moment of this narrative of, uh, of dollar weakness. In the equity markets obviously that's what we're going to talk about uh, most because you can see this big jump higher overnight in the Nasdaq future just wiping out then um, some of the, the losses that have been seen through uh, the back end of last week and also in the, the prior morning session and we can see that that was the aftermarket move here we exploded through that previous key level that we were looking at which is today's pivot so in actuality it's quite an interesting level perhaps to keep an eye on today you know if we do run into a bit of somewhat fatigue here in this nasdaq pop then any move to the downside here would be quite a key area that is actually if you can quite see it here that's the pivot level with that previous high and low and if i actually extend this chart out um, you can just about see it here above my video feed. It's had a few other uh, areas of significance from a point of resistance going back into the early and mid part of this month. So any pullbacks, that would be a really important area. Any further extensions, well then really we've got to get back above this uh, overnight Asia Pacific test with around that 10, 9, 20 to 30 area. Uh, and then if we did get a break, any further push then, um, you've got to look up to the the all-time highs once again would be quite a bit higher but not unattainable of course 
and that would be a key area. So 11,059 is the all-time high, which of course we, we retested back on the 21st and back on the 13th. So that's kind of the two key areas I'd be looking at in both bullish and bearish scenarios there. Uh, also, just given the, the dollar weakness, you know, you know, the yields continuing to, to fall across the board really, and I was looking at the US 10 year and the Bund this morning, and just looking here at the US 10 year, um, I've got a um, vertical line here showing everything right of that line being this year. So obviously a, a massive move that we saw when the pandemic was really taking hold, the response then in force from the central bank, the Federal Reserve. But interestingly, here in the, the US 10 year, we've broken out of the top side of what was a fairly long lasting and several month range, which was around 139.22. We tested, but never managed to close above it um, through the period of the beginning of the week until really we got to yesterday's session which saw a more definitive close above what well, actually came on Thursday an extension yesterday and so the upside now we've we've gone above 140 the US 10 year uh, could well see a more you know just grind it out and yields remain um, further under pressure pushing negative real yields lower and of course then that meaning that you know this is all a supportive narrative in my mind to help gold and with gold prices if we have a look at there you know, we, we've had two major attempts now, uh, I'm looking at the gold future here, of that 2000 level. Uh, the first one came on the 28th, we've had another one on the 29th, and here we are two days later, uh, but in cl very close proximity. We're back within this morning about a three and a half dollar range if we're testing that same level. Interestingly, if you look at the, the kind of size of the pullbacks that we've been having since we've hit these highs, um, let me just quickly update this. So I can add a few more rectangles. So we had this first pullback here, which was violent. Um, I mean, it, we went from 2000, pretty much to $75 pullback all within the period of, of a session. We then had that second attempt and the pullback less severe. So we've gone from 75 to $50 type pullback and to where we are at the moment. And so, you know, coming off that rule of thumb then, and with although it was broken slightly, this uh, longer term trend line I've been monitoring is that if we did get any pullback here in gold, then perhaps we get the pullback to this type of area or maybe down to the, the 1975, but just following that general rule of these ever more shallow pullbacks and the way that the dollar and US yields are shaping up, I do think that this test of 2000 could well come today. Uh, and just remember then how behavioral this market becomes. A lot of people obviously have got a bit of a gold obsession at the moment and people will be monitoring and tracking this very closely. And if we start then, you know, knocking on this door today, if, and you know, I'm, what, I'm gonna talk about equities in my view because I think on the balance then, you know, we've had this big extension pop on the earnings. That's now, you know, built into price. There is this Congress issue looming with a number of those unemployment um, exceptional benefits coming to a, a closure and it's looking like they're not gonna get a deal done by the end of the day. So if we got that equity sell off, feeds then that continuation of trend of dollar uh, movement and yield movement, then you know we might get a test, maybe we get a few tests, but then if we get the eventual break here, then that could well lead to quite an aggressive move then to see out the week. Uh, whether or not we'd get a straight break or perhaps a break and a pullback and then a continuation on definitely if gold in the right setup you know again from a behavioral perspective if we did um, firmly break 2000 we could quite quickly see 2010 2020 in in quick succession that's not to say that we'll close up that high but just be mindful if we get that break things could get interesting very quickly albeit you know keep in mind we're up 24 bucks already so again, i'm talking about this i do think there is a potential for that break to come today but obviously those other assets have got to shape up in the right conditions the ultra, on underlying point here is that look even with the nasdaq popping higher last night which you think naturally then should be a risk positive which should make gold in a logical sense come down you know gold's just playing its own tune at the moment so 
there's nothing holding this market or being able to sustain uh, this market lower at the moment. So I do think that break's coming when it comes on that first time when it really does break 2000, I think we're gonna see a big spike through it. Um, so you know, just be, just be mindful of that. All right, let's get stuck into a final chart actually before I move on to the headlines and talk about these earnings. Well, that was oil. I thought oil was really interesting yesterday uh, because I just happened to be in conversation with a few people at the time and, and, and it was Alex and I really talking to our, our traders and we were saying about how um, what could be the repercussion for oil and the interesting conversation was coming because of this idea that the whole of mainland Europe could go back into a lockdown and obviously that's going to have firm implications for then travel. Uh, and therefore the whole idea of consumption of, of these energy products and i.e. oil with no air travel in particular and there was a really key area um, let me just zoom this out first and then I'll zoom it back in but been looking um, at that that kind of 21 DMA has been a really good level that's that's been a good marker of supporting price uh, over the course of really June and July. Uh, we did form a really important uh, level, which was on 10th of July, which was at 38.54 in the futures. Now you can see going back to yesterday, when we broke through the 21 DMA with a bit more force, this was when people were starting to panic a little bit about the global, global COVID worsening of the situation at the time. And we were pointing out a level, and I was sharing with the guys, you know, keep an eye on that, 38.54, because now we've technically broken through that uh, 21 DMA with a bit more force and the way of which the other assets were deteriorating at the time with the, the kind of theme around coronavirus, that that in combination with the 50 DMA uh, was exactly you know, kind of all forming at around the same point. Uh, and we pretty much got there. Uh, we, we actually printed a low down at around 72. So we got into around uh, around a 15 cent range or so off that point. And then we saw a really wicked bounce back up by almost a dollar and a half off that level. So that's a really key area. Um, you know, I know a few of the guys got hold of that as the rest of the market started to settle a little bit after the initial push down. So you know, good job on that front. Uh, but yeah, oil as well looking a little fragile um, just given the fact that you know the OPEC deal is rolling so by definition then um, it's not due to last forever and at the moment we've got a fairly precarious global demand situation with coronavirus seemingly getting worse at this point in time uh, so definitely warrants worth keeping an eye on um, yeah, that, that's kind of the main gist of things, but I want to quickly run through some of the headlines and get you up to speed if, with these earnings and what happened. Uh, first of all, I guess I should inform you that there was some Chinese data overnight, not that really the markets responded to it um, to any strong degree. That was the Chinese uh, manufacturing PMI for July. It came in at 51.1. Uh, that was above expectations of 50.7. The non-manufacturing at 50. 4.2 was actually a touch softer than expectations. As I said, though, you know, I point these things out. It wasn't really a market moving uh, scenario. Um, quick look at these earnings then. Um, headline, you know, Apple, they basically have announced a, a four for one stock split. It's not unusual for Apple to do this. They have done this historically before. I think it was a few years ago they did a seven to one stock split. Um, so this comes, of course, after their shares have risen, the best part of 80% for the year. Um, they've confirmed the next iPhone will launch in a quote a few weeks later than usual. Obviously, people are looking at the disruptions perhaps to the, uh, the supply chain just given the COVID situation. But a few weeks is not going to create too much nervousness amongst investors in this stock. Their third quarter revenue, again, Apple a bit different. They report Q3 rather than Q2. Um, came in at 59.7 billion. That is a record figure and is sharply above expectations on the street for 52.3 billion. They're just going to run through the kind of main product mix and their services division uh, just to give you a sense and context of how awesome these numbers really were. Uh, revenue from the iPhone 26.4 billion above the expected 21.3. iPad revenues 6.6 .6 billion above the expected 5. Mac brought in 7.1 billion uh, against the same quarter last year, 5.8 billion. 
Apple's wearable division, 6.5 billion above the expected 6.1, and services, which includes things like the App Store, iCloud, Apple Music, things like that, 13.2 billion, uh, which was in line with street estimates, but up from around 11.5 billion a year ago. So, yeah, impressive numbers to say the least from Apple. And how did their shares perform in the aftermarket? Well, you've already seen the NASDAQ overall index from a single stock perspective, Apple up about six and a half percent. So huge move seen after market for that stock price. For Facebook, uh, second quarter sales top estimates as ads rebound. Uh, their second, um, the re- revenue rose 11 percent, 18.7 billion above the expected 17.3. They had 2.7 billion monthly active users. That was against an estimate of around 2.63 billion. So again, uh, monthly users soaring as pandemic boosts the need for social media. And a lot of the company was talking about the fact that their main ad revenue from digital advertising comes from smaller, medium-sized businesses. And these are the ones that are using well, this this avenue more so now than ever, given the, the global pandemic. Uh, Facebook shares after market. As you can see here, big reaction seen immediately, and they, they've held on to around 6.5% in aftermarket trade. So Apple and Facebook, the best part of a 6% gain. Amazon was an interesting one, because obviously a lot of people were looking at that, just given as well, they've, they've been the outperformer of the outperformers, if that makes sense. And they came out and had second quarter revenues jump 40%. 40% from a year earlier, 88.9 billion above expectations of 81.2. Their earnings per share just knocked it out of the park. And their guidance as well, they gave guidance for the current quarter that we're now in. Uh, and they said that it will range revenues between 87 to 93 billion. Um, that's against a street estimate of 86.5 billion. So they're already leading us the, the bar. Uh, is going to be smashed from where current street estimates are at this point in time. Operating income and anticipate to be in the range of two to five billion against a previous estimate of around uh, three billion. So, yeah, super strong uh, again overall in terms of, of, of Amazon. Um, I did see as well uh, yesterday, you might have seen me tweet that Amazon now, uh, at least in Britain, that is in certain um, locations, um, are going to be doing same day delivery with a, just a two-hour turnaround in food delivery uh, with Prime. And I just think you know, Amazon's just got it so sewn up at the moment. Um, and it's interesting, as we were pointing out last week, um, when we were talking about this massive outperformance of these mega cap tech names, you know, is it justified? I mean, are these companies just better placed to deal with a current environment like this? Uh, Amazon kind of epitomizing that e-commerce behavioral shift and then companies like Microsoft and Amazon even Alphabet's cloud division this whole working from home new architecture to be able to work from home all boosting these types of services you know things like Zoom it's got to be hosted on one of these major cloud platforms for example so are they just better positioned and you know and and are they just the the uh, it's validated almost given what's been going on but you know Obviously, the, these types of numbers will be hard to maintain forever. Um, this is reflective of that period of shutdown. So obviously, it's going to have accelerated this. Uh, you know, Apple talking about the necessity and need for people to stay in touch with, with family and things like this, increasing certain sales of, of different products. Um, but the last one was, well, before I go on, Amazon aftermarket. I'm afraid they added only 5%. So, yeah. A monster move after market, but uh, slightly shy of the six, six and a half from Apple and Facebook. Alphabet, a uh, little bit different. Uh, ad sales, which make up the bulk of um, the sales at the Google parent, were 29.9 billion. Uh, that was actually down about 8.1% from the same period of last year. But Google, uh, their ad sales were picking back up, they said, at the end of the quarter. So they're kind of like, okay, that was not great but things have started to pick up and actually it's looking a little bit more positive now and we're underway into the next quarter um, growth at youtube and google's cloud business the latter was up about 43 percent from a year ago so you know cloud computing is just booming at the moment if you think about microsoft numbers they were up nearly 50 percent google's cloud business is growing nearly 40 percent uh, on a year comparison basis 
Um, so those areas, YouTube, Google's cloud business continue to remain particularly strong. However, aftermarket, how did they perform? Definitely not as good as those other names we were looking at. There was a little bit of volatility in the aftermarket trade, first positive, then negative, and then basically leveled out relatively flat with a moderate gain of just 0.5%, uh, so not quite as good. But again, <clears throat> last night was a big almost risk for markets. I guess there was a little bit of apprehension that just given a massive outperformance in their share price, that perhaps it was kind of the bar was so high they were doomed to fail. It's almost far from it. They've just absolutely smashed the last quarter. So definitely keeps that um, kind of supportive nature for equities at the moment. We've heard from the Fed. The Fed aren't doing anything anytime soon. So they're in ultra accommodative mode. And then you've got these mega cap tech earnings just absolutely busting out to the upside at the moment with their numbers. Stocks have got to go up, right? I mean, that's what you would assume. Um, so definitely would keep an eye on the NASDAQ today. Remember we talked about those bullish bearish scenarios. I guess all things remaining equal and just what we've discussed here, you would have a long bias. But the risk, of course, comes through really this subject matter which is something we've been talking about all week, which is the discussions on Capitol Hill, which is about the expiry of the $600 week unemployment benefits. Uh, so getting you up to date with some of the latest commentary, Senate GOP efforts to pass an extension to the enhanced jobless benefits at a rate of $200 have failed. Um, there were also comments in White House Chief of Staff Meadows said that it was too late to avert a gap on unemployment insurance and that he was not even optimistic about getting that done next week. US Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin said, we're going back to negotiating table and that the best case scenario is that a deal is made in the next few days, but added will take time to reach an unemployment deal. So, you know, that thing that we were saying was quite a big risk for markets actually looks like it might become a material impact. And as these headlines are kind of suggesting, this does put at risk the, the shape and severity of how bad the virus is going to impact the US economy. Because if there's a lot of people now who are going to go unemployed, or in fact even homeless, given some of the tenancy agreement extensions that are also elapsing at the end of uh, this week, yeah, that's going to be a bad situation. So a few things to weigh up here from a fundamental perspective. Um, but you know, the one thing I think that's more clear, I think either way, um, T-notes, and gold, I feel, will, will, will be supported under these types of scenarios. Uh, the equity one, a little bit more of a judgment call, and I could understand people want to be long or short, but at the moment, um, you know, taking away that Congress issue, which is a bit, which is a considerable one, but the idea of the Fed having said what they've said, having seen yields and dollar perform the way that they have. And with these earnings performing like they are at the moment, when you think about the companies that reported last night, pretty much uh, a reflection of a quarter of the entire S and P 500. Well, um, you know that's a that's a pretty potent cocktail for for the equity market. All right, quick look at the calendar for today. Um, in the European morning, it's not too busy. We do have the European HICP flash. So the inflation numbers coming out for July, worth keeping an eye, that's on 10 a.m. That comes alongside the GDP flash preliminary number for Q2, which of course will be interesting. Um, then into the US afternoon, personal income uh, spending PCE numbers. Uh, you've also got the Chicago PMI and University of Michigan sentiment, but the final reading for July. And if an er earnings perspective, you get a couple of the oil majors, uh, so ExxonMobil, Chevron reporting. You've also got uh, Caterpillar, Merck, uh, some of the other bigger names of interest coming out today pre-market. All right, that is it from me. So hopefully that was useful. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Really appreciate all the support in the community uh, and I wish you a fantastic weekend ahead. All right, guys, take care.